introducing you to somebody that I've deeply looked up to, respected, admired for about two years, surprisingly. Um, we both met at a place called the City Gala, City Summit City Gala, and it was by the former Ryan Long who put it on. And he was a keynote speaker there, who's the founder of, as you all know, Priceline.com. And he has made his entire life built around the mission of giving back and helping others. So Jeff Hoffman, my man, welcome to Elevation Nation. <laughs> Thank you so much. So yeah. happy to be here, especially with you. <laughs> well, we've been friends for a while um, and we've always wanted to do a collaboration together. So I thought, you know what, debut show, this is it. And as we were kind of talking before the show started, you've got a really interesting story. We hear these compelling stories about entrepreneurs who become philanthropists. And one thing I've noticed in following your journey is that philanthropist is so much more of a label for who you are than an entrepreneur. Was it always like that? No, not at all. Tell me was, about there what was it was definitely, like you Definitely there was a turning point in that because I didn't have... Uh, I didn't have anybody to tell me otherwise. Uh, you know, the societal <laughs> messaging is that success is a, uh, you know, everybody's trying to get rich and famous. That's what society tells us. Today, everyone's trying to get internet famous on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. And in the business world, everybody's trying to get rich. So we're led to believe that the definition of success is some combination of one, two, or three of these things. Money, power, and fame. When somebody's wealthy, we say, oh, he made it. When somebody's famous, we say, wow, she made it. When somebody's powerful, you say that. And yet, you know, I have to tell you that I had uh, uh, along the way, you know, very wealthy friends who are miserable and very famous friends who are miserable. I mean, if you think about uh, um, Pickett, Kate Spade, yeah. um, you know, uh, Anthony Bourdain, Robin Williams, Clearly, money and fame were not the, the keys to happiness, but that's not what we're told. Those are the definitions of success. So I'm just being very transparent and saying that, you know, early on, that's the messaging I got. You go out there and try to, quote, make it. So there was no really focus early on. No one was pushing me to philanthropy. They were pushing me to make it in business. Uh, and so that's, that's, I was chasing that path because that's what everybody says to chase. Yeah. And, and you apparently made it. <laughs> um, I didn't go through your whole rap sheet here, but I mean, you've, you've got a long list of accomplishments out of all of them. Which one do you think has the biggest bearing that describes who you are as a human being? Uh, well, it's not any of the things I did in the past. It's the things I started doing when I made this big transition, when I quit being a CEO and I quit building companies, uh, which happened about, uh, I don't know, seven years ago. Um, yeah. After my last startup, which was ubid.com, we took ubid, it became a multi-billion dollar company. We took it public, blah, blah, blah. I was the CEO. That was the last company. And that was the point at which I said, I want to focus now. I don't want to build businesses anymore. I don't want to launch companies. I want to launch people. Um, so I left uh, that business. Well, I really wrote that down. Somebody, you people used to say, what do you do for a business? And I would say, for a living, and I would say, I launch companies. And one day, somebody asked me, and I said, I launch people. Um, and uh, so once I made that transition, uh, everything was different. But, but that, it, it didn't really happen, like I said, until I made a commitment to spend the rest of my life um, you know, trying to scale hope, not revenues. That that's beyond. I feel wow. Okay. Um, we were talking offline just now about you know how about six months ago I had my nervous breakdown about really what is that difference? And I would like to say you know with the most humble spirit, I was trying to chase it, and I was absolutely trying to make this brand monetizable and scalable. And the I made it moments, whether that's the money or the fame, you know, I wanted both if I can be completely transparent, like both of them. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. And then I realized, you know, like some of the, the wealthiest, most famous people I know, they're empty inside. And that was when I did a very, very strong pivot. Can, can you tell me about what was a time when you didn't have all the answers and you weren't the international <laughs> speaker, published author, Hollywood film producer, Grammy award winning jazz album artist, one of only 2000 billionaires in the world. Like this all sounds pretty amazing. And the things that we should want to strive for, 
But can you peel back the curtain a little and tell me about a time when you didn't feel like you had all these accolades? Yeah, there were a lot of times. Um, when I quit early on in my 20s, uh, so I went and got the engineering degree. And, and why? Because I was fascinated with engineering. No, because the world told me, get a, go get a degree in something where you can get a good job so you can get a good salary, right? So I was focused on a good job at a good company, a good salary, because that's the messaging, uh, mm -hmm. including your own parents, right? That's what mine were saying. I got an engineering degree and I got a job at an engineering company in my 20s now, getting decently paid at a well-known company. And so that's it. That's what everybody's telling you to do. Your parents are suddenly proud of you. So I had a good job. I had a good paycheck. What I did not have was a good life. And I hated my job and I could not stand my boss. And I went in every day and kind of stared out the window from my little engineering cubicle and said, this is really it, right? Actually, you're going to kick out of this. I remember one day thinking to myself, I can't believe I honked at the guy in front of me so I could get here faster today. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I let every car in the highway in front of me? I honked at someone because I was in a hurry. And I was like, to get here, what? And I was thinking, is this it now? And then I even had the, the, like the most revered guy at this engineering company who'd been there 26 years, Charles. Everybody there wanted to be Charles. And one day, Charles summoned me to his office. And this is really bad, but again, you know, we're, like we're here to be real <laughs> on your podcast. I was walking to Charles' office, and since I was in a bad mood because I hated my job, I was counting the steps from, where, from my cubicle to his corner office. And it took me 26 steps. And he'd been there 26 years. And as I was walking to his office, I thought, wow, I'm, in 26 years from now, I'm going to be 26 steps further. <laughs> and I was like, just kill me now. This cannot be my fate. And when I mentioned to people around me, I said, I don't really want this. They're like, are you kidding? Everybody here hopes they'll someday get to Charles's level. And I was like, well, if that's the case of everybody here, then I don't belong here. My problem was, where do I belong? Because when I told parents and friends, I want to quit this job, I don't want this, they said, you're an ungrateful idiot. You have a great job that people would kill for at a great company and you're well paid and you don't want it. So that was a time where I was completely lost. The world says this is the answer. I can't imagine it's the answer. And nobody is supporting me. Everybody I tell that I'm feeling lost is telling me you should be feeling thankful, not lost. So I, I really was lost at that point. I didn't have someone to tell me that there was another choice. Yeah, that's that's beyond beautiful. So uh, in uh, in Hawaii, the ancient Hawaiians have this entire concept over similar things, you know, the definition of success and their definition of success is that you trust your gut. It's, it's not the money. It's not the fame. It's that you trust your gut. And when you're lost is probably the most you need to trust your gut and the most time where you don't know if you should. What's a tip you can give for us on how do we feel found? Okay. So by the way, I'm really glad you brought that up because I always from early on started tuning out well, let me rephrase that. Let's focus on the positive. Trusting my gut and trusting my instincts. And, you know, I've said this before, uh, but I think that our gut instinct needs to hire a new marketing manager um, mm -hmm. because gut instinct has a bad reputation. Yeah. When you tell people, they say, how'd you reach that decision? And you say, I just kind of followed my gut. They're like, wait a minute, you didn't do a six month research study and bring in McKinsey? I said, yeah. no, I just followed my gut and made the decision in 13 seconds. That yeah. sounds to some people irresponsible and emotional. And in fact, it's because our, our gut is poorly marketed. Your gut instinct should be rebranded as your fast intelligence. Mm. And the reason why is your gut instinct is the sum total of every bad decision you've ever made and every good one. Yeah. So in fact, as your gut, when your gut tells you don't go left here, don't go left because your gut speaks to you for a reason. So later, when I started finding bit by bit that my gut was giving me way better advice than all these people around me, I started trusting my instincts a lot more. And even just because the whole world is telling you, 
that this corporate life is the key to success doesn't make it right. And if I had believed that, my gut was telling me maybe they're all wrong and maybe they're all more, not all, but maybe a lot more of them are less happy than they appear, you know, and they're trying to talk themselves into, they're trying to convince themselves they're happy, not me. Maybe my gut's right. Maybe there's something else for me. I'm not judging them. So I'm glad you brought that up because I started trusting my, quote, fast intelligence and making decisions way more on my gut than I used to uh, because I used to let people talk me out of that. Yeah. And we have this whole entire concept, really, that I teach where, um, you know, for some of the executives listening, it might get a little out there for you and trust it because there's a reason you're listening to the show today. And so we have what's called our higher self, our unconscious, and then our conscious Well, our unconscious stores those things that our conscious doesn't necessarily remember. So, you know, it's the thing that keeps us breathing. It's the thing that keeps our heart beating. And it's guided by our higher self, which in some um, philosophies is called your gut, right? So your gut can't be wrong because it's giving you a signal of what it is that your unconscious mind has perceived that your conscious mind wasn't necessarily aware of. And that's where that power comes in from it. And it sounds like that's what you were picking up on when you're like, well, this isn't my definition of happiness. And it's not necessarily about what other people were thinking, but it's about how you interpreted that thought in relation to the other people. And I think that's what's absolutely brilliant. So let's go back to that. You, Your gut was telling you one thing. Um, you were clearly at a separation point. Once you were told that one thing, did you have another epiphany or another gut reaction of what you should be doing instead? Or did you just know it was wrong and then you had a period of like losing who you were to find who you were? Yes, the latter. (laughs) Uh, Lost in the middle there because I only knew what I didn't want, but I didn't know where I belonged yet. Um, And that took a much longer process to get there. Can I, you can edit this down if you need to. (laughs) Can I make a... I want to share uh, resonant frequency with you. Is that okay? Yeah. It's a it's a, a a story of what helped me find myself really really achieve some level of, of balance. I don't even like that word anymore. Um, later in my life, so I'm going to tell you this story because it's it's it was the tool. It was a moment that really epiphany moment for me and finding yourself and finding your 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 you know uh, where you belong. So. Um, I'm going to skip the details of this. It's a story for another time, but uh, considering I'm not, by the way, I am not saying that wealth or fame or any of those things are bad. What I'm saying is they're not the destination and they alone aren't going to make you happy. You can have those things, but don't count on those things to center you or to be the end game. Um, Because I do know people that have achieved those things and are happy, but they weren't happy. They're not happy because of those things. That's the point. But anyway, I say that because at this point, I had made a childhood bet with myself about a car. I'm not a car person, and I'm not a material person. Uh, The very short version is, one day I saw a poster of a Ferrari. I grew up as pretty much a poor kid. I don't even know what that was. And I said jokingly, because everyone was so fascinated by it, I said, one day when I grow up, I'll buy a Ferrari. And everybody I ever said that to burst out laughing. And so I said, why is this so funny? And they're like, dude, you're never going to own that, a car like that. None of us are. And I remember thinking, well, not with that attitude. So I made this little childhood bet with myself that if following my instinct and doing the right thing is right, for example, somebody said, Jeff, you'll never be successful in business. And I said, why? And they said, because you're not an asshole. I said, what does that have to do with it? And they said, you have to be much more of an asshole to succeed in business. I said, who says who? And they said, have you ever heard the expression, nice guys finish last? Yep. I said, yeah. And they said, it's there for a reason. And then I was a little shaky. Why is that a saying? And so I said, you know what? They're wrong. Now, that's just a weak excuse. And so I fundamentally believe that not, that not being an asshole is the key to success. Treating people really well should be my path. If that's true, and I'm right, then I will follow that path. And I should be able to, again, this isn't a story of cars or money. I should be able to buy that Ferrari someday because I should be successful by doing the right thing. So that was the bet I made myself. If I'm right, I'll buy the car just to prove it's doable. Didn't want the car, but I did. I did buy it when I achieved this, a certain list of things. So the reason I'm telling you that story is I took off one day, Sunday morning drive in this racing Ferrari that I bought. And I was driving this car 
Oh, and for some reason, real quick, the mic's cutting out and it's really far oh, away. Shoot. I don't know why that is. Um, is that better? <laughs> uh, talk a little bit and I'll let you know. Is that, uh, was it better? I moved oh, a little bit. Perfect. Now you're perfect. Okay. But it sounded like you were across the room. So welcome back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> All right. So I, uh, I eventually bought that car. And on one Sunday morning, I took the car out for the ride. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a race car. And I was out driving and it was Sunday morning, 5 a.m. No one's on the road. So I decided to drive fast. Not recommended. Do not try this at home. Um, I drove 70 miles an hour, 80, 90. Now, this, this car was this racing Ferrari. It's really loud. It sounds like a jet. And so as you're driving, the car is, is, is so loud. So at 80 miles an hour, 90, 100 miles an hour, the car is roaring, 110, 120. A weird thing happened. I hit 130 miles an hour and the car went dead silent. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I, you know, I worked so hard for so many years to get this car and I just broke it. Mm -hmm. And, but I didn't know what was going on. Why is the car silent? And so I kept pushing it to see what would happen at 140 miles an hour. It got loud again. Then 150, I went, I went about 170 miles an hour before I chickened out. Again, do not try this at home. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, I got home. I called the dealer called the Ferrari people. I said, can I ask you a question? They said, what? I said, I was driving the car. It was really loud. But when I hit 130 miles an hour, the car went dead silent. I said, what did I do wrong? He laughed. He said, you didn't do anything wrong. I said, what happened? He said, the car hit resonant frequency. I said, what is resonant frequency? He said, the car was designed to cruise at 130 miles an hour. So when you hit 130 Every gear, every piston, every piece of that car was in perfect harmony, exactly doing what it was designed to do, exactly where it was supposed to be. It went silent because it was in resonant frequency. And I hung up the phone and I said, resonant frequency, huh? And then a thought occurred to me. I said, what's mine? What is my resonant mm -hmm. frequency? Where am I supposed to be and what am I supposed to be doing that I will feel like I am exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing? So I, I just want to end the story by telling you that I did something that any of your listeners can do. I went home and I wrote down what are the gears of my engine, right? Happiness, fulfillment is a multivariable equation. So I wrote them all down on a board. I wrote down spiritual health physical health, mental health, relationship health, financial health. I put all these things down because those are the gears of my engine, right? And you're never going to achieve perfection, so quit trying. What you're going to do is do the best you can and get them as close to balanced as you can. And so I wrote those things on the wall. And what I would do, like at the end of every week, I would go over and look at it and I would say, which of these gears in my engine are green? which are yellow and which are kind of smoking red right now, which means they're in trouble. So you'd look at it and you'd say, right now, my relationship health is good, but my friend health is bad. I haven't visited my friends in a while. And so then what you do is I'd say, I need to make it a point to go spend time with my friends. Then I'd come back and that one went back to green. But I had an argument with my mom. So now my parental relationship is a little bit red. So I would go spend some time with my mom. Then you have a financial issue and your financial gear is a little out of whack. So by you can't find your resonant frequency if you're not looking for it. And I developed that formula by writing all these things down and constantly looking at them to say nothing's ever in balance perfectly and it's never going to stay that long. But as long as I'm paying attention to all those variables, I have a pretty good chance of being a pretty happy person and feeling found because I know what now what it takes for me to actually feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So thank you for indulging me, but I wanted to share that story because I ask people all the time, what is your resonant frequency and what are you doing to get to the place you're supposed to be? Yeah, I don't know why. And I have no concept of why you would want me to edit that out. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, folks, that's the show. <laughs> that was beautiful. And uh, you know what I like? So uh, a very big mentor of mine, his name's Jack Daly, and he's an internationally renowned sales trainer. And he comes at it like he's such a hard ass, right? Like, you know, 
don't find motivated salespeople, you know, you hire them that way. He's just such an overt alpha male. And uh, <laughs> he's also a big teddy bear. So he's probably listening right now and he'll murder me for this. Um, and he introduced me to his concept of MVP, which I do every year. I'll send you it. You'll, you'll get a kick out of it. Um, and it's similar to that in that it's you pick all the categories of your life and you create your bucket list or your to-dos of what it is you want to accomplish in the next 12 months on your master vision plan. So it's like your bucket list for all the categories in your life. And then you rate it every single month of which which section are you crushing it? Which ones have you kind of been slacking off? And so that's what it makes me think of. And both of you are just incredibly inspirational. And it's it's interesting that you both figured that out and then went off and started teaching it to other people. And so that's that's incredible. What do you do though? Let me ask, let me ask a real question, right? As if this podcast hasn't been real enough for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you probably thought you were going to come in and talk about business or your repurpose. <laughs> I like this way better. <laughs> Me your topics. too. Um, <laughs> the last show would have been all business, but, uh, you know, we're elevating now. So um, let's ask a question. So you thought you found your path. How did you deal with it when people said that you were probably wrong? Or that they didn't trust in you or believe in you? Like, what was your like, you know what, that's cool. I believe in me. What was that conversation with yourself like? All right. So there, there is two parts of that. The truth is that does give you self-doubt, especially if they are people you look up to. Yeah. And they're people that you thought were authority figures and smart, and they're telling you you're dumb and, uh, or you're wrong. And so I have a I had always for always had this whiteboard when I would write down the, the 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 you know the things that drive me the most important lessons in my life and I'll tell you what I wrote down that is the answer to your question I wrote down this I wrote down we get our advice from proximity not relevance and it's because of a learning that I had you're listening to people because of their proximity to you not their relevance to your life and I didn't know that and I I Figured that out because when I quit, fact, let me let me tell you this story because it was when I quit that very engineering job I told you about, and it was the very gentleman Charles that I walked twenty six steps to see. When I quit, he called me into his office, and he said, "I hear you're leaving," and I said, "I am," and he said, so "You think what do you think you're going to do?" I said, "I don't know, probably something on my own," and he said, "Oh, you think you're going to be an entrepreneur with total disdain?" Yeah. I said, "I think so." And he said, well, you're wasting your time. And he said, but don't come crawling back to me asking for a job. I don't want you back. And I said, okay, I wasn't really planning to do that. Why do you think I'm going to come crawling back? And he said, because you're going to be a failure in business. And I said, why do you think that? And he said, three reasons. And I said, okay. He said, take a seat. And I guess he was going to tell me. And How so we decided to share these. Pardon? How thoughtful of him. <laughs> yes. He decided to share these reasons. And he said, the first reason you'll never be successful at business, Jeff, um, he said, uh, was this, uh, I think the first one was lack of, uh, fo oh yeah, I don't know if you remember now, lack of focus. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, sometimes uh, you, you know, you seem to be working on multiple things at once. He said, and when I've been in this engineering company, he said, when they give me one thing to do, I've worked on that one thing for three and a half years without doing anything else. And he said, but sometimes I see you and you're working on more than thing at once, more than one thing at once. He said, your, 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 your inability to focus makes you horrible at business. And I said, OK, uh, thank you, I guess. And he said, wait, wait, there's more. He said the second reason. And so he said, the second reason you'll be a failure at business he said, impatience. He said, Jeff, you're the most impatient person I've ever met in my entire life. And by the way, as a side note, he's probably right. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, he said, I've had times where I wanted to get something done that I submitted upstairs to management. And it might be a year before I got approval back. But I'm patient. I can wait. He said, you're so damn impatient. You'll never succeed in business. And I started to get up. And he said, wait, there's a third reason you're going to be a complete failure. And by the way, there was a baseball bat in his office. And I was about to say, can you just beat me with the bat so we can get this over with? At least that's proving because you're impatient. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I'll take the pain now so I can get out of here. 
And he said, the third reason you'll never succeed, he said, is because you have zero respect for authority. He said, the rules were created by people way smarter than you, right? The books were written by people that knew what they're doing, not you, not some young person who thinks he's so smart. And I was like, I didn't say that. And he said, you have no respect for authority. The rules are there because people smarter than you created them. And that's why things are the way they are. And you always question everything. So he said, you know, those are the three reasons you'll fail at business. When I went home, I felt kind of bad because this, by the way, happened to me, the smartest person I know. Uh, And the smartest person I know just told me I was the dumbest person he knows. It hurt. And I was a little, I had serious self-doubt, but I got over it. I slept it off and said, I'm going to keep going forward. And then I reached out. I started thinking something. Charles is giving his uh, advice to me based on his career. But it occurred to me, I don't want to be Charles when I grow up, even though everyone else at our company does. I don't want to be him. I want to be someone else. So then I said to myself, well, Jeff, who do you want to be? And there was a man in the community that I idolized, looked up to, admired, named Roger. I said, I want to be Roger when I grow up. Roger was an entrepreneur, not a corporate guy. So I reached out to Roger, and I reached out to Roger, and I reached out. And eventually, I got a note that said, Roger will give you 30 minutes Starbucks meeting under one condition. I said, what's the condition? He said, you agree to never ask, never reach out to us again. Quit bothering us. <laughs> they said, will you go away if we give you 30 minutes? I said, fine. So I went and met with Roger. Our 30 minutes ended almost three hours later. And Roger said, wow, Jeff, you're going to be a great entrepreneur. And I said, why do you think that? And he said, three reasons. I said, Shut what? <laughs> he said, you're a brilliant multitasker. I said, really? Because yesterday I was out of focus. He said, when you start a company, you have to focus on your core mission, but you're going to have to do lots of tasks early on to get there. Your multitasking skills are amazing. He said, the second reason you'll be a great entrepreneur is he said, because you never put off till tomorrow anything you can get done today. I said, oh my God, that was called impatience yesterday. He said, in the entrepreneurial world, that's called drive and persistence. You're always pushing. Why don't we just do it now? And he said, that's a great trait. And he said, one more thing. And I said, what? And he said, you'll be a great entrepreneur because you have no fear of the unknown. I said, wow, that was disrespect for authority yesterday. He said, just because no one's ever taken that path to the left, he said, you don't seem afraid to try it anyway. And despite what the quote experts have said. So that's when I went home and wrote down, you got to stop getting your advice from relevance and start getting it from proximity. Reach out to somebody you want to be like when you grow up and listen to what they say. And so that's how I got out of that place. Because when I started being around people, I want to be like, it turns out that they get me, I get them. And they didn't give me negative encouragement. They said, man, you're on the right path. Even though literally the day before that, everyone in my life told me I was wrong. Okay. Uh, So I think we're all crying right now. Um, (laughs) That can't just be me, y'all. Like, please message the show and tell me you feel this too. Um, Because that was absolutely beautiful. And it's, you know, it's interesting. We take this in the, the context of entrepreneurship, but like, you know, I've been told every single one of those, I'm like getting emotional. Dang it. Um, my job is to make you emotional, Jeff, not vice versa. <laughs> um, listen to the show. <laughs> I pride myself on how many executives I can get to cry in an hour. So um, dang you. Um, but like, it's, it's interesting because I look back at, you know, every major pivot point I've made or every breaking point or every tipping point, And there was always somebody I was listening to that gave me the advice and loving, you know, they meant well, but yeah, I'm too impatient, you know, and I always say the sense of urgency is the key to success, everything now, nothing later. And that came from yes. not knowing if I was going to live in the hospital. Right. So of I had course. to have you, you had a real reason. Yeah. Like, and I just got off a coaching call, you know, and um, they were like, you know, be more patient. And I'm like, I don't know. Like patience <laughs> is not my fucking answer, bro. Like appreciate you. And no, um, and then it's, you know, focus on one thing and only own that one thing and master that one thing. And I'm like, but there's so much more than one thing in life. Like we're trying to get you your purpose. We're trying to get you your passions. You know, we're trying to help you come into power because of your purpose and passions. Like, that's not like I'm going to teach, you know, how to have the best peanut butter and only talk about peanut butter. Like there's more to life than that. And um, 
yeah, you hit me hard there. So I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that lesson. And just knowing that, you know, as we go forward and we go back to our careers or businesses, no matter what's going on externally, you know, enjoy multitasking, enjoy being impatient, enjoy having drive, you know, and it just, it's so, it's such a message needed. So thank well, you. Thank for you. And, and just want to make sure people realize that your proximity is husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, best friend, sister. They're all telling you that you're wrong or they're telling you that you're right. And it may just be surprisingly that none of those people are qualified to actually give you that advice. Find your tribe in the world and listen to them. Find your tribe. That's the most beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. So as we wrap up, um, which sadly, like I could, we could carry this on for 12 hours. I've never gotten tired of, you know, our, our texts or our conversations uh, following you on Fox Business. I mean, you're such, you're, you're the kind of guy that we all want to be, right? Um, so give me some advice. Leave, leave our listeners, our sharks, we call them sharks. Um, give our sharks that thing. Like if they're driving to work or commuting from their bedroom to their living room today, um, <laughs> what's the thing <laughs> that you want to leave them with if they are in a place where they feel lost or doubt or they're listening to advice from people that frankly have no business giving them advice? You know, I, I think I'm going to uh, reiterate, even though it's a it's an you know it's an an old concept, it's not a tired concept, which is that you really are uh, the sum total of the people you surround yourself with. And so, my life changed dramatically when I started hunting for my tribe, and I made a conscious effort to find people that I wanted to be around and people I wanted to be alike and trying to build relationships with them. They may not be in your life. They may not, may not be in your physical proximity. But one thing we've learned during COVID is it's a virtual world and even more so now. Like I said, I was talking to people in Croatia and Serbia this morning. Um, you can reach out to anybody anywhere. So start, you know, start to this process of, of projecting your future self and not way in the future as soon as you can get there. What do you want to be like? And who do you want to be like just as some model and find those people. Build your tribe, even if you don't have them today, so that you have people that, that you admire and look up to in your life. You, you replace negative energy with positive energy people. And you're not asking for people to validate you just because you want to do. You're asking for people to run your opinions by whose feedback, whether it's positive or negative, you're way more likely to take because they are on a life path or living a life that you want. Um, I, I think you need to invest more time into removing the negative people and adding the positive people, even if you don't even know them, boldly reach out. Okay. That, thank you. Thank you. So Sharks, listening to this, I mean, I, I know you're feeling exactly what I'm feeling over there and that's why we created this show. And you know, we're, we have the privilege of talking to one of the most successful business tycoons in the world. And what I hear him telling you is our antiquated definitions of success need redone. Our definition of success needs to be in trusting who it is that we know we are in a deeper level and also in finding the tribe that supports us by proactively going out, creating and fostering those relationships and using it as a world to, as cheesy as it may sound, make the entire world better. And by that, and by that changing of that definition of success, we grow in a way that far exceeds any of the conscious expectations we could create on our lives. So go do exactly that. And Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. And I look forward to you and I continuing our conversations off the show. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye.